Good evening, Grace Point. Okay, that's more like it. Um, so this evening, I'm going to be preaching to you out of the book of Ezekiel. Um, for those of you who don't know, it's in the Old Testament. Um, but before we get into the Word and before we get into tonight's sermon, I just want to open this time in a word of prayer. Father God, I thank you so much that we get to be here today, tonight, Lord. I thank you so much that even though we come from different paths, Father God, and that we, we've come from different places, Lord, I thank you so much that you unite us and that we have one common goal, and that is to get to know you more and to get others to know you, Father God. So I pray that today you empty all of us and that you fill, fill us with your spirit, Father God, and that each and every one of us here do not leave the same way that we came in, Father God, and that we have a real tangible experience with you tonight. I pray this in your name. Amen. So I'm going to be reading, like I said, from Ezekiel. It's uh, chapter 22, verse 23 to 31. Um, it will come up on the side screens so you can follow with me there. Again, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, say to the land, you are a land that has not been cleansed or rained on in the day of wrath. There's a conspiracy of the princes within her, like a roaring lion tearing its prey. They devour people, take treasures and precious things and make many widows within her. Her priests do violence to my law and profane my holy things. They do not distinguish between the holy and the common. They teach that there is no difference between the unclean and the clean, and they shut their eyes to the keeping of my Sabbaths, so that I am profaned among them. Her officials within her are like wolves, tearing their prey. They shed blood and kill people to make unjust gain. Her prophets whitewash these deeds for them by false visions and lying deviations. They say, this is what the sovereign Lord says, when the Lord has actually not spoken. The people of the land practice extortion and commit robbery. They oppress the poor and needy and mistreat the foreigner, denying them justice. I looked for someone among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so I would not have to destroy it. But I found no one. So, I'll pull out, so I will pour out my wrath on them and consume them with my fiery anger, bringing down on their own heads all they have done, declares the Sovereign Lord. Amen. So... When my parents asked me to preach this evening, I was a little bit taken aback considering that it is Father's Day and I am not a father nor a man. So I felt quite out of my depths before this evening even came. Then on top of that, my dad suggested to me that I should preach on the same um, verses in the same scripture that he preached on and I was like okay no that's no problem until he read Ezekiel 22 23 to 31 to me and quite honestly I, when my dad read this to me I first said what does this have to do with fathers okay and second of all it's quite a bleak passage in the Bible. I mean, for Father's Day, I thought maybe we could speak about the Father's heart and how much he loves us and how his son, he loved us so much that he sent his only son to die for us, but instead we have this, um, <laughs> on behalf of the land, so I would not destroy it, but I found no one. I will send down my fiery anger. So... Obviously, I'm quite excited to speak on the scripture tonight. I really do feel blessed and honored to be here. Um, but as I was going through the scripture and as I was deciding how I was going to relate this to Father's Day and stuff, I, I mean, it was really difficult for me. But there's, there's one thing that I, there's two things that I do know that I am a daughter to an incredible father, and that I pray and hope one day that I'll be a wife to someone. Can I get an amen? Amen. Okay, cool. I declare it. I, I, I take it. Okay. So that is the place that the sermon is coming from. I, I have grown up with an incredible father figure, and I just... Uh, and I guess that's the only way that I can relate to this day in. So please bear with me as I try and relate this sermon to Father's Day, but also re remain relatable um, to everyone here. While I was prepping for this 
the sermon I was doing an incredible amount of introspective work. When my dad was speaking to me about what to pray for and what I, what I should preach on, he said, okay, well, well, maybe take it as what you would like in a father, like what you wish I had done better. So I thought, okay. Then he said, and also while you're prepping for the sermon, just think about what you would like one day in a husband. So I thought, okay. So I started a list, as people do. I started a list and I started writing down things what I wanted in a father. And as I was writing down these things, I realized that my dad was those things. My dad was that person. My dad was, a, I was in like the D team in every sports, but he was still at every single water polo match, every single hockey match, just to watch us lose again, or just to watch me sit on the sidelines. I was in every major production and I was quite a poor actress. So I had a very, very supportive father. Then I was starting to write down what I wanted. Don't worry, I am going to relate this to the scripture just now. So then I was thinking to myself, how can I relate this like to a husband that I want one day? I thought, okay, this is where it can get interesting. So I started writing down the characteristics of what I wanted in a husband. And that just got so much worse. Because I started writing down like someone that when I don't feel like leading will lead me. And then I scratched that out because I realized that I, I'm a leader. And then I started writing things down like someone who would bring security. Then I scratched that out because I realized I can bring security. So at this point, it became a very dismal list of what I was going to preach on and what the father's heart looked like or what the husband's heart looked like. So I decided to take the sermon from a different approach. I started relating it to men and women. So tonight, I apologize in advance, it's not a Father's Day sermon, nor is it a sermon completely directed at men. It is a sermon for all of us. And while we can still celebrate fathers on this day, I think that it is also okay to be speaking about men and women as a whole. And how we, as a community of believers, as a church, can contribute to making this world and South Africa and Joburg a better place. So for those of you who came for a Father's Day service or of some sorts, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I'm excited to, to preach on what I feel like God has laid on my heart. He's laid three points that I just want to, I want to share with you tonight. Specifically in Ezekiel, he speak, God is speaking here, or Ezekiel is speaking out specifically about a gap. In verse 30, he says, I looked for someone among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so I would not have to destroy it. But I found no one. I used to and I, I used to run a ministry together. He still serves there, but we used to run a ministry called Gap. And it used to be spelt in big capital letters. So while I was writing the sermon, there was a million times where I wrote the Gap in big capital bold letters just to realize that that isn't the Gap that we're speaking about. So here, if I end up shouting Gap at you, I'm not shouting it. It's just because I put it in capital letters for some unknown reason. So let's look at this Gap. My first point leads me to what God is looking for when it comes to this gap. What God is looking for to replace this gap. What kind of people he wants to fulfill his need in this gap. And the first thing that I came to is God is looking for people that will lean on him. You see, friends, history has a heartbreaking way of repeating itself. So we read scriptures like this and we go, oh, you know what, it happened so many years ago. What makes you think that there's still a gap in today's society? What makes you think that God is still needing a gap to be fulfilled? When I see young people getting further and further away from the church, I realize there is a gap that needs to be filled. When I see racism, I see that there's a gap that needs to be filled. So we may not be in the biblical days, but history is repeating itself in 2018. And there's a gap that we need to fill. And the only way that we can fulfill this gap and the only way that God can use us is if we lean on him. And there's a Proverbs 3 verse 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. As men, as women, as Christians, 
We have a duty to fill the gap, and filling that gap means leaning on other people. Okay, Tanasha, can you just come up here quickly? Okay. Oh, Daniel, can you also come here, please? Sorry, he's producing. Both of you, come here. Okay, so how many of you used to play that game in school? I like to think that I was in school a long time ago, but I think it was only like six years ago, which is not long. So I don't know how many of you... Come, please. You're the worst. Okay, how many of you used to play that game where you used to just fall back and like back into someone's arms? D d yes, have show of hands. Okay, that's great. So basically, essentially, what's happening here is God is asking us to lean on him, all right? But he's not asking us to lean on him with one foot securely on the ground and just put some of my weight on God, okay? He's asking us to lean on him. We're best friends. It's okay that this is happening, okay? So it's okay. God wants us to lean on him completely, he doesn't want us kind of one foot on the ground and like just kind of, okay, God, I think you can handle this much of it. He wants us to do all of it. Every part of our being, every part of who we are, the confusing parts, the judgments, everything, he wants all of that on him at all times because he can handle it. Okay, thank you. Okay, this is my brother Daniel. Hi, Dan. Okay, so... For this point of view, Daniel is God, okay? So God wants us, he doesn't instruct us to lean parts of us on him, as I showed with Tanache. If Daniel drops me, it's okay, I'll forgive him. But if Tanache dropped me, I don't know so much. I'm gonna jump on your back, okay? Okay, you ready? Are you ready? Okay, step a little bit forward though. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, so essentially, this is what God wants from us. A bit to the left. So he will carry us, and it doesn't matter where we go, what direction we think, okay, go forward, what direction we're going in. This is the complete faith that we should have in God. Because God can carry us no matter what. It doesn't matter what your matter, what your plans or or your dreams are. God is willing and able to do so. Daniel's hands are shaking. God is stronger than this. Okay, you can drop me. Okay, thanks, you can go off stage. Thank you. You see, friends, and you see, church, it is easier to keep one foot on the ground and one foot not in the boat. It is safer, but it is not effective. And I understand that it's not easy. I'm, I am what some people would call a complete control freak. I have... I hate not being in control. It really is a problem. Three years ago, I went to a conference in Cape Town with my, uh, my friend Jamie lives there. And um, because I was staying with her, that means that she was driving me around. I lasted two days. Day two got in. I said, Jamie, it was her car. I said, I can't take this anymore. I have to drive. I, I, please just let me drive. She said, okay, okay, fine. She said that was a little bit scary. So I drove for the rest of the two weeks that I was in Cape Town. And I was thinking to myself while I was doing the sermon, how often do we do that with God? We're okay with God being in the car with us. We're okay with God being there. But he can't touch the radio. He can't roll down the windows. And he certainly can't touch the steering wheel. But what we don't realize is that we would avoid 100% of the accidents that we get in to if God was steering, if we were leaning on God's understanding. As men, as women, as Christians sitting here today, we have an obligation to completely and wholeheartedly rely on him even when it's scary. No, 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 not even though it is scary. And that is what we have to do. And that is what we're called to do. In order to fill this gap that we are finding, we have to lean on God completely. Sorry. My second point is that we are a generation of men and women who are called to lead. While I was prepping for the sermon, it, uh, I think... 
some of the most common sermons are on leadership. Pastors think because they're pastors, they have this unlimited knowledge on leadership and what leadership looks like and how we should lead and this is how many people we should be leading to. And success only looks like if you have a 10,000 seater church and, and that is what real leadership is. Real leadership is when you are at home, at work, and you're picking up the mantle of Christ and telling people about him. This is not what leadership looks like. Leadership is when we step out that door and we are making a change. And leadership is hard. It's really hard. Because it takes us to uncomfortable places. Mary was a leader. She's not a typical leader. But Mary was a leader. I don't think it was easy for her to be accused of committing adultery before she was married, yet she continued, yet she persevered. I don't think it was easy for Moses to lead a whole bunch of crybabies through the desert. I don't think it was easy for Noah to build an ark in a time where there was no such thing as rain. It is not easy to lead, whether you're leading two people or 10,000 people. God has called us to be men and women who lead. Isaiah 41 verse 10 says, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help, and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous, hand, my righteous right hand. The gap is leadership. We are lacking leadership in today's time. And we do not have a sense of what real leadership is. We do not have an understanding of what it is. I bet you, as I said um, that tonight, the second point has to do with leadership. I bet some of us had a huge sigh of relief because we're like, I'm not a leader. We've been conditioned to believe that a leader looks like something, whereas it doesn't always look like that one image. It doesn't always look like someone standing on stage. It doesn't always look successful. We need to be leaders. I have recently started working in the corporate world. I work for a bank. Um, I, so I studied theology, and, and my passion is the church. But I decided to try something different. I wanted to, all I've known is the church, so I started a corporate job. And um, for people who know me, their question is always like, Rebecca, what are you thinking? What are you doing? Trust me, I'm asking myself the same question every day. But what I know is that God has put me in a place and a time for a reason. And I do believe that reason is to lead people to Christ. And I do believe the reason that I'm found in a place that I don't like and I don't want to be in and that I'm uncomfortable in is because I need to be speaking about Jesus in the corporate world. I don't think it's my future. I don't think I'm going to be there forever. But I think for now, that is where I'm called to be. Maybe you are teachers. Maybe you are doctors. I don't know what any of you really do. But wherever you are, there's space. There's a gap for you to fill, for you to change lives, and for you to be a leader. I was contemplating whether or not to add this part into my sermon and then I realized that God wouldn't lay anything on my heart that wasn't meant to be said. So I'm going to speak some hard truths here for men and for women. We're called to be led, we're called to lead in uncomfortable situations. Men, this is a generalization. But men, when you sit there at a boys' night out and one of your mates make a rude remark about a woman, make a joke about a woman, it is no longer cool, it is no longer funny to let that joke slide. It is no longer okay not to stand up for the woman that you know. It is no longer okay to sit idly by and let your friends make rude and sexist remarks about women. As Christians, we need to be calling our friends out as on those things because, I don't know, sometimes we forget that is what Jesus did. They were ready to stone the woman in adultery. Jesus said, stop. 
Peter was so ready to blame the blind man on a, on a family disease, Jesus said, stop. Women, it is no longer okay for us to bring men down. It is no longer okay for us to sit on the sidelines while our friends or even us mock and mimic women who have made different choices to us. It is not okay for us to mock women who have chosen to work a nine to five job and still be a mom. You can still be an excellent mom even though you have a full time job. The same way it is okay to be a stay at home mom it does not make you lazy or less ambitious. We are called to fill the gap. When our friends are racist, when our friends are homophobic, when our friends are saying things that we do not agree with, it is no longer okay to sit there in silence. It is time, it is now, where we fill that gap. And that goes for myself, because I'm telling you now, I've sat there while my friends have made disgusting remarks and I've said nothing. And this is the gap that I really believe we are called to lead people out of. It is time to not be silent. Each and every one of us are born for such a time as this. And the time is now. The time is now is to lean on God, to be led by God, and to lead those to God. As I go on to my last point, we are called to love. Undeniably, fiercely, and strongly. The thing about, uh, uh, as I said, I'm a theology major, so I, I like to think I know, I can understand some of the Bible, but the fact is that I don't even understand 10% of the Bible. Whenever I read verses like verse 30, I'm always in awe of God. He always bowls me over because he does everything in love. He says, so I will pour out my wrath on them and consume them with fiery anger, bringing down their own heads. All they've done declares the sovereign Lord. It doesn't sound like he's doing it in love, but he is. We are called to love each other undeniably and fiercely, like Jesus loved us. I'm just going to ask the worship band to come up so long. If you are sitting here tonight and you want to pick up this mantle and you want to you want to lean on God more, you want to lead your communities, you want to lead your families. You want to lead your colleagues at work. It's uncomfortable, these conversations. But these conversations are necessary. And I know this is going to sound ridiculous. I went to my mom before I preached. And I said, Mom, I really feel like God has laid this on my heart, but I don't know if I can do it. I don't know if I can say it. And my mom said to me, you just got to lean on God completely. So tonight, if you feel like there's a stirring in your heart, and you're like, I want that. I want to change people's perspectives. I want to lead people to Jesus. I want to work in, walk into work tomorrow with a light that is shining within me and out of me, that people know that there's something different, that I have something different to offer. If tonight God is stirring that in you, for you to be a different person tomorrow, for you to lead people to Christ. And if you think, I want to lean more on God, Rebecca, I want to lean more on Him so badly. That can happen tonight. That is how easy it is to lean on God. So I'm just going to close off with worship and There'll be leaders in the front here, and, and if you want someone to pray with you, whether it's about any of this, or, or whether you're just feeling alone and lonely, and like you don't have anyone to journey with, please will you come up for prayer. We're family, and we want to pray with you, and we so badly want to journey with you. So let's just bow our heads and pray. 
Father God, I thank you so much for each and every person that is here tonight, Lord. I thank you that we can come here without the fear of being persecuted. We can come here without the, the fear of being judged. Lord, we can come here and we can find home. We can find people that will love us. We can come to a place, Father God, where no perfect people are allowed. Because we are not perfect. Yet you love us still. Yet you call us son. You call us daughter. You tear off your favorite robes, God, and you wrap us in them. You make a feast for us when we least deserve it. And I thank you, Father God. And I pray that tonight there's a shift, that there's a change, and there's a wave of your Holy Spirit. I pray this in your name. Amen.